This disgusting bird, wrote Charles Darwin, with its bald scarlet head, was formed to wallow in putridity. Yet, they are useful, fastidiously clean, and very graceful birds. They deserve another look. This is how vultures are often seen and generally imagined. While the king of beasts stalks and makes his kill, they skulk about at a safe distance until he's eaten his fill. Then, when the coast is clear, down they come to squabble over the scraps. the typical vulture image. But does the image reflect the reality? They are the most numerous and perhaps the most successful of all the birds of prey in the world. But just why are they so successful? To find out, we travel to the Serengeti, where the most complex and best known community of vultures can be found. The Serengeti is the home of a uniquely rich and intricate network of wild animals. Lions and other predators can live here in such numbers only because they're supported by a much larger number of plant-eating animals. Some, like giraffe and impala, remain in the woodlands throughout the year, where water can be found even in times of drought. But there are relatively few of these residents, and the predators rely for most of their food on vast herds of migratory animals, gazelle, zebra, and wildebeest. They spend the year circling the Serengeti in pursuit of the rains and the fresh young grass which springs up in their wake. 90% of the hoofed animals are migrants. By far the most numerous are the wildebeest. Recent counts show that there are about a million and a half wildebeest on the Serengeti, and in all, nearly two million animals feeding and traveling across the plains. Just a small fraction of these will provide food for the predators. There's a huge number of mammal predators on the Serengeti. Most of them scavenge as well as kill, the hyena is the most abundant of the predators. At least 2,000 hyenas live in family burrows scattered over the plains. Hyenas are fast-moving and highly successful killers. Their kills are traditionally associated with vultures. Because vultures are sometimes seen hanging around hyena kills, it's been assumed that they get most of their food from the hyena's leftovers. The truth is very different. A predator must expend a great deal of energy to catch its prey and risks injury as well. And not all attempts are successful. So having made a kill, the hyenas eat every morsel they can and vigorously defend the carcass.
With their powerful jaws, hyenas can clear a whole carcass this size in half an hour, leaving nothing but a few scraps for the vultures. The great number of vultures found here could not possibly survive on such meager pickings. They take to the air, as ornithologist David Houston does himself when vulture spotting. For the past 15 years, Houston has been studying two distinct groups of vultures. One group is found in the rainforests of South America. But here, over the Serengeti, is where his fascination with these birds began. Vultures are wonderfully graceful in flight and wonderfully efficient too. Griffin vultures in particular, they soar high above the plains, making use of warm air currents to gain their altitude gliding all the time rather than flapping their wings. Gliding takes hardly any energy at all, but they can move at a good speed nonetheless. They can cruise all day at around 45 kilometers an hour. And all the time they're scanning the ground for signs of a carcass. I don't think their vision is particularly acute. They just have a marvelous bird's eye view. A single vulture is the first to spot the carcass, but it's soon joined by another. At first, they're very cautious, checking to see that the animal is really dead. But soon, they're coming in thick and fast. Most vultures won't have spotted the carcass themselves. They see a neighboring bird go down and follow it. A more distant bird follows the first and so on. The message spreads like ripples in a pool. Most of the vultures at the carcass are of the same species, Rupel's griffin vulture. But the next one is a white-backed griffin, similar but smaller and browner with a dark bill. White-backed vultures forage generally over the plains, but Rupel's with their horn-colored beaks hunt by following the migratory herds. This way, they are often the first to spot one of the many animals that has died of natural causes, disease, or starvation. Three quarters of all the animals that die on the plains die from natural causes. And it's from these, not from predator kills, that vultures get almost all their food. Mammals can't really compete with the vulture community. Vultures usually spot the carcass first, and they can fly to reach it much faster than a mammal can run. Often, it's vultures only. Although the squabbling at a carcass appears chaotic, each species has a specific role to play at the feast. A bird that eats meat is very dependent on its bill. The two species of griffin vulture have long, powerful bills with a sharp cutting edge. They can tear meat from the accessible parts of the carcass, though they can't open it up for themselves. The bill of the marabou stork looks and is useless for taking meat from a carcass. And yet, the storks are seen regularly patrolling the edge of feeding parties they found a way of getting their food second-hand.
But now, the feeding has to stop. The lappet-faced vulture dominates at any carcass. With its huge wings and menacing gait, it looks to be the largest of the vultures. In fact, the rupels are substantially heavier, but they always give way. The lappet-faced vulture uses its great hooked beak to open up the carcass, to the benefit of all the other birds. Griffin vultures are still arriving. It's not unusual to see up to 200 of them gathered at one carcass. Lappets, on the other hand, rarely assemble in large numbers. They usually travel in pairs and family groups. Since lappets feed on skin and sinew and don't reach deep into the body cavity, they don't have long, bare necks. However, the bare skin around the head, decorated with folds or lappets, is important for communication. When angry or amorous, the skin flushes bright red. This head-twisting display, used in greeting as well as in courtship, shows off these bare patches of skin. Meanwhile, some quite different looking vultures are foraging round the griffin's coattails. They are Egyptian vultures. And again, their beaks give a clue to their feeding habits. Slim, delicate beaks, which they use to pick up tiny scraps of food dropped by other birds. Although they're the smallest of the African vultures, they actively prey on the young and eggs of other birds. In fact, they're known to use stones as tools to break open ostrich eggs. As they finish feeding, some of the vultures head for a nearby pool. Vultures are thought of as dirty. In fact, they take every opportunity to drink and bathe and clean themselves up. At the carcass, hungry birds are still arriving. The well-fed retire to the sidelines with bulging crops. The crop can hold up to four and a half pounds of food. Now is the time for cleaning and grooming the plumage ready for takeoff. These vultures have a special plumage problem. Hours of every day are spent soaring and gliding on their magnificent wings. The feathers become twisted and distorted by the air currents. But five minutes, spread out in the sun, brings them back into shape. The last species to appear at the carcass is the hooded vulture. These birds are similar to the Egyptians in body size and shape of beak. Their role is to retrieve any tiny scraps that are left over. At last, peace descends. 
It's time for a nap. Soon the vultures are rested. They take to the air once more. The most successful scavengers, the supreme sky hunters of the African plains. But half a world away, a totally different group of vultures is sky hunting too. Over the green ocean of tropical rainforest. In the forest of South America, there are few large mammals no vast herds as there are in East Africa. But even if there were, how could a circling vulture find them on the forest floor? Well, there certainly are vultures living in the rainforest and several different species of them. They're totally unrelated to the vultures of East Africa and the fact that they look much the same is due to convergent evolution. Adapting to the same kind of lifestyle has produced very similar physical characteristics in both groups. This is a turkey vulture, a species in which Houston is especially interested. For the past few years, he has been trying to learn how they find their food and what food is available to them. Nearly all animals in the forest live up in the canopy, a world of wildlife on stilts taking advantage of the abundant leaves, flowers, and fruits. A marvelous variety of birds is found here. More bird species live in South America than anywhere else in the world. But birds are not the only items on the vulture's menu. Probably the commonest animals are the sloths both the two-toed and three-toed. They live in great density up in the canopy. In some areas, there are almost a thousand slots to every square mile of forest. When they come to the end of their placid lives, most likely dying of old age, they fall from the canopy at an average rate of about one slot per square mile every other day. Annually, the sloths alone provide over a thousand pounds of potential vulture food for every square mile of forest. But the canopy is alive with many other forest animals as well, like spider monkeys and howlers. Some of these will die from sickness or accident too. Adding all these animals together, in each square mile, one small animal will fall to the forest floor each day. There are actually more carcasses for the vultures here than in the Serengeti, if they can find them. The next step in Houston's study is to watch the vultures in action. An experiment not with sloths or monkeys, but the nearest available substitute. This involves a visit to the town market. As it happens, this market is a typical haunt of the vulture people most commonly see here, the black vulture. There's no mystery about what they feed on or how they find it. Blacks hunt purely by vision. Once they foraged along waterways and forest edges, but now they've discovered that wherever there are people, there are plenty of scraps.
Houston sets his bait early in the morning before vultures are on the wing, so there's no chance of them seeing and following him. But there are always other animals to look at on the way. The tamandua, or collared anteater. and toucans with their brightly colored beaks. The bird he's hoping to attract is the turkey vulture. The turkey is particularly successful at finding carcasses in the forest. In fact, it's nearly always the first to arrive. The suggestion is that it finds the prey by smell, very unusual for a bird. It's most unlikely that the turkey vulture would be able to see a small carcass from up above the treetops, but Houston makes sure. He uses a chicken because it's about the same size as the sloth or monkey that a vulture would normally expect to find on the forest floor. Checking to see that he has not been watched, Houston retreats to his blind. He waits to see if turkey vultures can really find a carcass by simply smelling it. Turkey vultures spend a lot of time circling above the forest, but not at great heights, like the griffin vultures of the Serengeti. When they are actually foraging, they slide back and forth, just above the treetops. The vulture that finds its prey by sight dives down at top speed. Finding prey by scent is a much more gradual process. The vulture must home in on it bit by bit, sniffing its way down. Well, this certainly seems to show that turkey vultures have no difficulty at all in finding their prey by smell. 
In fact, I'm really quite astonished at the speed and efficiency with which they can do it. But they're not the only animals around here with a sense of smell. This is a little tegu lizard. Normally, it would take frogs and insects. Well, that seems to be the end of that bit of bait. The arrival of a caiman is pretty unusual, but Houston is interested to see which of the other forest animals compete with turkey vultures for food. Many of them are active at night, so once it's dark, Houston checks his baiting sites again. I suppose the tapir is the largest animal I've encountered on my midnight wanderings, but tapirs only eat plants, of course. However, carnivores do sometimes turn up at my baiting sites, the coati, for instance. But they're pretty inefficient at locating carcasses. They only find about one in 20 of them, and they don't take very much meat. As scavengers, really, they're just amateurs compared to the turkey vultures. As long ago as 1826, the American ornithologist James Audubon also carried out experiments to discover if turkey vultures could smell. He came to the conclusion that they couldn't. Possibly he offered the birds old rancid carcasses, which they reject. If carcasses are fresh, they'll sniff out every one within 24 hours. This is a really big carcass, a capybara a large rodent that lives in the forest ponds and waterways. There's food here for many birds. The turkey vulture isn't going to win many beauty contests, but it's superbly designed for its way of life. The naked head and neck help it to keep clean and cool. The olfactory, or smelling, area of its brain is highly developed, and there's no missing those huge nostrils. When it turns sideways, you can see right through one nostril and out the other. Most birds have only a rudimentary sense of smell. Only the turkey vulture and its close relatives can hunt by using this sense. This ability has made the turkey vulture the most widely distributed vulture in the Americas. From southern Canada to South America, they can be seen hunting over desert, plain, and forest.
a black vulture has come down to feed. The black has no sense of smell. It found the carcass simply by keeping an eye on the movements of the turkey vultures. In the Serengeti, all vultures operate by sight. Here, the seers follow the smellers. Black vultures are the tough guys of the vulture world. They travel in large, aggressive flocks and often chase turkey vultures off a carcass. They're not the only vultures on the trail of the turkeys. Occasionally, a very rare and special bird follows them to the kill. The king vulture one of the bird world's strangest flights of fancy. It's not a particularly aggressive bird, but instantly dominates at any carcass when it appears. Remarkably little is known about the king vulture. Its breeding behavior has never been observed in the wild, and it's seldom even seen in flight, probably because it operates at much higher altitudes than other vultures. The king's role at the carcass is similar to that of the lappet-faced vulture in Africa. Its large and powerful beak enables it to open up the tough skin of the capybara. Soon, others will join in the feast. And this one, believe it or not, is a juvenile king vulture. In a few years, it will look like its spectacular parent. So in South American rainforests, the vulture network operates in much the same way as on the African savannas. Although some of the foraging techniques are different, both groups rely on flight. But flight isn't just a way of getting food. In the Serengeti, it enables vultures to raise young more safely and more successfully than many of the powerful predators of the plains. Early this morning, these lions killed a wildebeest. Now they're resting. They'll feed again at dusk. To judge from the spotted marks on their legs, the cubs are a couple of months old, still at the stage when their mothers are nursing them. The two lionesses are probably sisters. They share the care of the cubs.
This whole pride is well-fed and healthy. It's migration time. Food is abundant and close at hand. But soon the wildebeest will be moving on in search of fresh grass. plains are practically swept clean of prey. For lions and all meat-eating mammals, raising young is almost impossible at this time. It's this transitory nature of their food supply which governs the number of mammal predators on the plains. But not the vultures. The lappet-faced vulture is a large and spectacular bird with a wingspan of more than eight feet. It nests in solitary splendor in the crown of an acacia tree. Like most vultures, it lays only one egg. Lappets can breed throughout the year, but most often the young bird is in the nest in need of constant feeding at a time when the herds are far away. And yet, this one is doing well, a chick much larger than an adult golden eagle. Not far away, a family of handsome white-headed vultures is finishing off a meal. African vultures are believed to be descended from eagles and hawks, and certainly white-headed vultures look remarkably like eagles. Like the lapis, they breed throughout the year. This new arrival with the brown head is a juvenile bird. Whiteheads are almost always seen in pairs and family groups. They prefer to feed on small animals, in this case a jackal. But the lappet plans to take some of their food back to its nest. Both of these large and handsome species hunt quite differently from the griffin vultures. Instead of soaring high over miles of savanna, they concentrate on a small territory, patrolling up and down at low level. In this way, they usually manage to arrive first at any carcass in their area. Back in the acacia tree, the young vulture waits to be fed. The parent has carried the meat home in its throat pouch. The delivery looks unpleasant, but it's simply the easiest and safest way of airlifting food back to the nest. While white-headed vultures specialize in small carcasses, lappets feed mostly on various kinds of gazelle. Both diets have one great advantage. They're available not too far from the nest all year long. This well-nourished young bird is about ready to leave the nest. The egg of a lappet-faced vulture takes 55 days to hatch. Then it's another hundred days before the chick is fully developed and ready to fly. Altogether, five months are spent in the nest. An adult lappet-faced vulture is one of the most powerful birds on the plains. 
Not only does it take precedence over all the other vultures, it's suspected that occasionally it uses its fearsome bill to kill on its own account, or at least to finish off weak and sickly animals. There are, however, relatively few lappets on the Serengeti and even fewer white-headed vultures. The most numerous are the griffins. They nest in colonies. Virtually all the rupels nest on the cliffs of the Gaul Mountains, on the southeastern edge of the Serengeti. After feeding, they have a journey of up to 150 miles to reach their nests. Spectacular cliffs are the home of many thousands of griffin vultures. It's unusual for birds of prey to nest in large colonies. And why should so many birds that compete for the same food live so closely together? David Houston has been making a special study of the griffins. Well, the first thing you might say about the cliffs, um, if you are the vulture of a state agent, so to speak, is, is that they offer easy access out onto the plains. You just need to take off from your ledge and you can be out there in moments. The height of the cliffs is a great advantage too. A vulture sitting on the ground has to wait for the air to warm up and for the thermals to form before it can really take off. But on a cliff ledge, a vulture can take off at first light and get in far more foraging time each day. The food being far away at certain times of the year is no problem for a vulture. Their soaring flight consumes so little energy that they can glide all day and hardly notice it. There is competition for food, but this is outweighed by the advantage of having neighbors around you to help you find it. Finally, there's a tremendous choice of suitable breeding sites. High, narrow ledges that are inaccessible to predators like baboons. Unfortunately, they're equally inconvenient to ornithologists. No one knows how many years have passed since vultures first occupied these cliffs. But it's certainly possible that the bird perched on this ledge today could have been perched there a half century ago. They may live for 60 or 70 years. Rupel's griffins are very large birds, some of the largest in the world still capable of flight. They don't reach maturity until they're at least six years old and even then won't breed every year. Those birds not nesting gather on nearby ledges. The rearing of young is a lengthy business. This chick is about five weeks old. It will be nearly four months before it's ready to leave the nest. So including time for incubation and nest building, the adult vultures are occupied with parental duties for eight months.
At 10 weeks, the vulture chick starts to look more like its parent, with the beginnings of a hooked bill. At about three months, the young bird has grown its first brown feathers. Griffins usually seem to time their breeding season so that the migratory herds are nearest to the breeding cliffs and food is easy to find at just the time when the young birds leave the nest and have to fend for themselves. But the effect of all this is that over the months while the chick is in the nest, the vulture's food supply may be miles away. So the parents operate on shifts. One spends a day foraging while the other keeps an eye on the nest. Then roles are reversed. Vultures do have a problem with the quality of food, if not its quantity. Adults are able to bring back very few pieces of bone to the chicks, and therefore their diet is short of calcium, essential for building a healthy skeleton. It's not clear how or if this deficiency is made good. It may be that this is one reason why vulture chicks develop so slowly, and also why the female lays only one egg. However, there's no doubt that griffin vultures are remarkably successful parents. Once a chick has been hatched, nearly 100% of them survive to leave the nest, an extraordinarily high success rate. On the floor of the gorge, Maasai herdsmen have brought their cattle in search of water. The dry season is a difficult time for them. But the vultures are unaffected. They are very versatile birds. Their way of life is remarkably adaptable to changes in the weather patterns and fluctuations in food supply. Wherever the migratory herds may be in the course of their epic journeys, griffin vultures can still find them. Another young bird is about to leave the nest. Although a fledgling can fly from the moment it leaves the cliffs, the skill and coordination shown by adults takes time to acquire. The first weeks of flying solo are spent maneuvering and soaring with the experts.
Flight is the essence of a vulture's life. Their mastery of the air enables them to flourish in four continents among forests and cities, plains and mountains. The freedom of the air belongs to the sky hunters. <laughs>